My name is Eigil Somset. I am the chief technology scientist for cardiology in GE Healthcare. And I'm also a professor at the University of Oslo in Norway. I joined GE Healthcare because I found that it is the best way for me to have a positive impact on healthcare. As a researcher and supervisor of PhD students, I contribute to uncover new knowledge, disseminate it to other researchers, and contribute to the education of tomorrow's engineers and developers. I have supervised 12 PhD students so far to successfully defend their thesis on topics that have pushed the envelope of what is possible within medical image processing, visualization, and artificial intelligence. As a member of the GE Healthcare Product Development Organization, I help turn research results and new developments into products that can be used in patient care. GE Healthcare is an innovation factory. We transform knowledge into clinical practice through product development. I also had the privilege to work closely with world-class clinical researchers, both globally and here in Norway. At the Rikshospitala, we are just starting a new project called ProCardio. It is focusing on prediction of disease progression in cardiology. In this session, we will focus on the management of chronic coronary artery disease. I will walk you through the pathway from early detection, diagnosis and treatment to follow up. We will take a look at each step of the pathway and discuss the role and value of G Healthcare's cardiology product portfolio. We will also talk to Dr. Salmia Kamrudin. She will share some of her work on the role of echocardiography in management of symptomatic chronic coronary artery disease. Dr. Kamrudin is a non-invasive cardiologist at Auctioner Health System in New Orleans and a senior instructor of Queensland. She is an advanced echocardiographer and received her cardiac imaging training at the Cleveland Clinic. Her research interests include three-dimensional echocardiography and myocardial strain. She received Auctioner Excellence Fund for evaluating myocardial strain at peak stress in stress echocardiography. She's also spearheading the Women's Cardiovascular Clinic at Auctioner Health System. Coronary artery disease is the leading cardiovascular disease burden worldwide. One person dies every 86 seconds in the United States from coronary artery disease. About 366 Americans die from coronary artery disease each year, and about 18.2 million adults aged 20 and older have coronary artery disease. Coronary artery disease is also a major comorbidity driving other cardiovascular diseases. 73% of heart failure patients have coronary artery disease as a comorbidity. 65% of valvular disease patients have coronary artery disease as a comorbidity. 46% of atrial fibrillation patients have coronary artery disease as a comorbidity. And 42% of peripheral vascular disease patients have coronary artery disease as a comorbidity. Now, let's take a look at this video. Accelerate the exceptional when you triage chest pain patients. Own quicker, accurate insight and apply it at every contact. Untether your team to excel under strain. So you replace time to treatment with speed to recovery and help raise patient outcomes at an unparalleled rate. Let's help your chest pain teams operate at a higher level. The development of atherosclerosis from early onset to symptomatic coronary artery disease can stretch over decades. When a patient with chronic chest pain shows up in the emergency room, some of the key questions are, what is the likelihood of coronary artery disease? Where in the disease progression is the patient? And will the patient benefit from revascularization? We will define the pathway in four phases. Early detection, diagnosis, treatment, and follow-up. We will look into each of these 
through the lens of the tools G Healthcare offers in our toolbox to image, monitor, guide, and document the disease. When developing a care pathway approach to coronary artery disease, the key in early detection is risk assessment and to establish the probability of coronary occlusion or rule out the existence of coronary artery disease. Risk factors including age, gender, high blood pressure, low density lipoproteins, blood sugar, obesity, and smoking. The first step in the pathway is to complete a medical history of exam and labs. Subclinically, risk assessment will help to put preventive measures in place. For symptomatic patients, establishing the probability of coronary occlusion will guide the choice of further diagnostic examinations. To assess the subclinical risk of coronary artery disease, coronary calcium scoring can be a great tool. Coronary artery calcium, as measured by CT, is a highly specific feature of coronary atherosclerosis and a great modality for early detection. CT calcium scoring has emerged as a widely available, consistent, and reproducible means of assessing risk of major cardiovascular outcomes, especially when planning primary preventions such as statins and aspirin. In this 10-year population follow-up study, Event rates in those with calcium score equals zero range from one to 6%, while for those with calcium score more than 300, the 10-year event rates range from 13 to 26%. Our SmartScore is an advanced imaging software that quantifies and scores cal cardiac calcium and provides information on coronary artery wall calcium plaque buildup. It automatically detects calcium, highlights it in green, and correlates the resulting score to age group cohort to determine the patient's risk. The ECG can identify patients with possible prior events and other ECG abnormalities suggestive of ischemic coronary artery disease. The GE Muse NX system, our latest ECG management and overrating system, offers the ability to easily compare ECGs and quickly identify if any ECG changes are new or consistent with previous abnormalities. In symptomatic patients, the presence of changes in Q wave, ST segment, or T wave abnormalities can increase the pretest probability of obstructive coronary artery disease. This functionality not only identifies patients who need further workup, but prevents unnecessary testing. In a value-based environment, the ability to reduce unnecessary testing is crucial. Echocardiography is an important modality for assessing cardiac function for patients that present with atypical chest pain or symptoms of heart failure. Resting echo can provide valuable therapeutic guidance and prognostic information which may inform the value of revascularization or contribute to the assessment of pretest probability for obstructive coronary artery disease. Comorbidities such as left ventricular dilation, aortic stenosis, mitral regurgitation, or LV aneurysms and thrombi can be visualized and help predict the risk of cardiac events and death. GE Vivid series offers high-quality echocardiographic imaging and assessment of myocardial strain and early wall motion changes. Uncart artificial intelligence developed using deep learning can recognize standard cardiac views with 98% detectability and provide fast analysis of strain patterns. Detection of early systolic lengthening, decreased systolic shortening, or post-systolic shortening by strain imaging techniques might be helpful in patients with apparent normal LD function, but with clinical suspicion of chronic coronary syndrome. To learn more about the role of echocardiography in the early phase of evaluation of chronic coronary syndrome, let's hear from Dr. Kamrodin. Hello, Dr. Kamrodin. How are you doing today? Uh, fine, thank you. Good morning, and thank you for having me. We're so glad to have you joining us and, uh, and sharing uh, your insights about myocardial work in uh, coronary artery disease. So please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. 
Um, good morning. So I'll be talking about utility of myocardial strain imaging and diagnostic algorithm of cardiac chest pain. Uh, evaluation of chest pain in the emergency department to the intervention that's going to follow. Here are my disclosures. So the objective of this talk is to, uh, first of all, learn what is myocardial work and myocardial efficiency? How is it performed? How can myocardial work and efficiency enhance the use of two-dimensional stress echocardiography in differenti differentiating chest pain from acute coronary occlusion versus demand-mediated ischemia in the setting of non-ST elevation acute coronary syndrome? And lastly, we'll talk about what is the additive role of myocardial work and efficiency in improving diagnostic accuracy of stress echocardiography in a non-acutely non-acute uh, coronary syndrome patient. I would like to start my talk by discussing this ischemic cascade that we've been learning uh, about since uh, medical school. Uh, we learn it in our cardiology training. Um, there is an ischemic cascade uh, at a metabolic level that we see in patients that present with chest pain, starting with metabolic alterations, perfusion abnormalities, diastolic dysfunction, systolic dysfunction, and ECD changes, followed by angina. Well, a lot of patients that we see in the emergency department may or may not have ECG changes, but have uh, actually angina without systolic dysfunction. And what I'd like to propose is that in a lot of these patients, it actually is abnormal myocardial strain mechanics. That is that they have abnormality of myocardial strain deformation, even without uh, significant systolic or diastolic dysfunction. And in these patients, um, before the ECG changes, which a lot of them, and especially in non-acute ST elevation uh, syndrome, you do not have significant EKG changes, this may actually be extremely useful to be able to differentiate if there is actually acute coronary occlusion of one of the major vessels. And I'll show you subsequently the data behind this. The, the next slide explains what is myocardial work. So myocardial work is... Um, my, my cardiac work is defined by the pressure volume loop uh, under the curve. Uh, and so think about stroke work. We know about the volume pressure relationship. That is the area under the curve of a volume pressure relationship is the amount of stroke work that the heart is doing. Now, instead of the volume, what uh, the software does is it, 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 it measures strain by event timing. So you've got You've got the myocardial, uh, you've got the mitral valve Doppler timings and aortic valve Doppler timings, and you're using them to create a pressure strain uh, loop uh, that in the area under the curve is actually equal to the amount of myocardial work done. And this has actually been validated um, uh, with invasive measures that the stroke work that you have with volume pressure relationship is actually equal to the pressure strain relationship. Now, how do you measure this on, this, on, on, on GE? So the way this works is we're all quite familiar with the measurement of global longitudinal strain, uh, where we measure the strain speckles in four, two, and apical long axis, which gives us a bullseye map. And we are able to measure the global longitudinal strain. Now the next steps are to measure mitral valve opening and mitral valve closure as seen on this Doppler tracing. Uh, once this event timing has been added and systolic blood pressure is added to the software, what you get is a pressure strain uh, uh, loop. And so the area under the curve is actually the true myocardial work. Uh, as you can see, I have marked uh, the events here, which is mitral valve closure, isovolemic contraction, aortic valve opening, aortic ejection, aortic valve closure, isovolemic relaxation, and mitral valve opening. Uh, there are two curves that you can see. There is a blue and a red curve. Uh, the, the red curve is actually that of a healthy patient. And you can see that the myocardial work is, uh, uh, it, it seems like a healthy loop where in a patient with uh, multi-vessel coronary disease is the pressure volume loop curve that you see in blue. Now you see that the area under the curve is reduced. Um, and so in, in, in a lot of these patients, there is significant amount of um, reduced work that is being done by the heart because of decreased uh, 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 de true deformation of the myocardium. Here is a bullseye map. So once you have added a systolic blood pressure and you know the global longitudinal strain, each segment, assuming a systolic blood pressure of 120 and a global longitudinal strain uh, percentage of 20%, each segment will perform myocardial work of 2,400 millimeter Hg percentage. Um, 
Now, <clears throat> you'll get a bullseye like that. And what you're going to see is you're going to see each segment and the total amount of myocardial work done is at, at, at each segment. Now, B is a uh, bullseye map of a patient with no coronary disease. Now, in C, you see some patients have significantly decreased strain. For example, here in the septum, the strain is decreased to 618 and 840. Then there is uh, another blue area in the posterior region, which is extremely low, just 742 millimeter AG percentage, which shows very reduced myocardial work in the inferior, inferior uh, basal inferior wall as well. This suggests that the patient has at least significant LAD disease. So the bullseye map itself, uh, where the normal is in the green area, the red is where you have really high amounts of myocardial work. And I'll show you some examples of that. And the blue is where you've got significantly reduced myocardial work that is typical of patients who have got uh, coronary disease, acute coronary occlusion, et cetera. Now, what is myocardial efficiency? So on the, on the top here, you see then when the LV contracts, you have systolic shortening of each of the speckles of the myocardium. And then you get relaxation, and then you get the dia diastole. What's happening at the, if you look at the strain graph, you can see that you get significant shortening or of, of, the, of the segments where the strain uh, curve is below the line or it's negative. Uh, that means the speckles are coming together and are shortening. And it's immediately after aortic valve closure is followed by relaxation of that segment, and which is the isovolemic relaxation time in which the segments actually lengthen. Now, what, what is myocardial efficiency is that it's the amount of constructive work or work that is shortening in systole and it's negative or it's um, it's negative in isovolemic relaxation. That is called the constructive work of the myocardium. Now, instead, um, take an example of a patient that has severe ischemia. A lot of them, the segments, rather than shortening in systole, can actually lengthen in systole. And in isovolemic relaxation, rather than lengthening, they can shorten. So if you're actually having lengthening in systole and shortening in isovolemic relaxation time, that, in fact, is wasted work. And so myocardial efficiency is a way or a measure to evaluate how much of the myocardial work is in fact highly efficient. So it is a measure of constructive work divided by constructive plus wasted work. Here's an example of a pressure strain loop, a bullseye map of, of showing that this patient has very high myocardial work. You can see that red in the apex is extreme amounts of myocardial work. And the reason for that is that this patient's blood pressure is 242 by 112. Therefore, when you add a normal, relatively normal strain, the GLS here is minus 17. And when you add the high amount of uh, blood pressure to each segment, some of these segments have extremely high amount of myocardial work that you can see in red. And the rest of them are green, which is actually normal amount of myocardial work. So this data <clears throat> comes from Dr. Marvick's group. And you can, uh, where he performed myocardial work and efficiency in, uh, in healthy patients, I believe the number was around 90 patients uh, who are undergoing a treadmill stress echocardiography. Uh, and he measured myocardial work in healthy adults um, uh, at baseline. And he showed that a average myocardial work in a healthy adult is about 2,100 millimeter AG percentage. And the average myocardial efficiency in a healthy adult is not 100%. It comes to around 96%. Um, there is still uh, some amount of wasted work that you see in, in a normal heart. Um, I'm going to give you a few more examples. On the top in figure A, you see myocardial work and efficiency in a healthy patient, which you have a great pressure strain loop here. And on the right side, you have a bullseye map of myocardial efficiency. And you see that each myocardial uh, segment is highly efficient to about overall 96% myocardial efficiency. Here's another patient that does not have any coronary uh, disease, but has multiple risk factors for coronary disease like diabetes and hypercholesteremia and hypertension. And in this patient, the myocardial work is overall decreased uh, compared to the one at the top. Still, the myocardial efficiency overall of this heart is actually preserved and is about 96%. 
compare this <clears throat> to figure C, where now you see the area under the curve is severely reduced in a patient who has had an infarct. And you can see that uh, overall uh, myocardial efficiency of this heart is reduced to 84%. And you can see that there are parts of this uh, uh, map, uh, specifically in the apex, you see that there is significantly reduced efficiency, which means there is probably a large scar in the apex. Uh, now compare this to a patient who has heart failure with reduced EF. And in this heart, there is this heart is high, doing high amounts of wasted work, where the myocardial efficiency is now only 67%. Um, presence of left bundle branch morphology, dyssynchrony because of an akinetic parts of the myocardium can make the myocardium extremely inefficient, as you can see in figure uh, D in the bullseye map, as well as on the pressure uh, strain loop. So. Why is myocardial work an important measure of true myocardial contractility? And really the question is why should we care? Because we know and we have learned over the past 10 years or so that global longitudinal strain is the correct way to measure the true contractility of the myocardium. Well, the problem is that the global longitudinal uh, strain is highly affected by changes in afterload. And this could lead to misinterpretation of true myocardial contractile function. So if your blood pressure was 180 or 200, you could have significant reduction in global longitudinal strain. But when you um, create a product of systolic blood pressure uh, and uh, global longitudinal strain, and you actually measure the area under the curve of the pressure strain loop, uh, there is um, uh, it actually represents a better uh, metric of the true contractility of the myocardium has been shown by uh, uh, multiple uh, uh, authors. And I'm gonna show you some papers that myocardial work is in fact superior to global longitudinal strain as it accounts for deformation as well as afterload by adding systolic blood pressure to the evaluation. Now I'm gonna give, to prove this point, I'm gonna give you an example of two cases with the only difference being uh, the systolic blood pressure in these two patients being different. Here's an example of a 65 year old with multiple risk factors with significant chest pain at rest with, with the degree of risk factors that, that he has come in with. Um, you know, he's, he, he very much looks like a patient that has true cardiac chest pain. His blood pressure is 140. Uh, his, his troponin leak is one at a normal creatinine. Well, that's a significant amount of troponin leak. He's got normal wall motion. His EF is 60%. He does not have any valvular abnormalities. And the question is, should we take this patient to the cardiac cath lab. Now, the same patient comes in with the same parameters, same vitals, and same labs, except now his blood pressure is 198 by 110. And should this patient go to the cardiac cath lab? But clearly, both the patients are significantly high risk, but are they experiencing a non-ST elevation MI? Are they, in fact, acute coronary occlusion? Because we know that there are many reasons to have troponin elevation in the setting of chest pain, and not every one of them is having an acute coronary occlusion. Is there a way that myocardial work could differentiate um, a patient with acute coronary occlusion versus a patient who not, does not have acute coronary uh, occlusion? So this is a great paper uh, from Dr. Uh, 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 Smithset's group uh, in Norway at University of uh, Oslo in Norway, published in 2015 in European Heart Journal, Cardiovascular Imaging, that uh, does strain analysis in 150 patients with non-ST elevation, acute coronary syndrome, and right before coronary angiography, Acute coronary syndrome on the angiogram was defined as stimmy flow of zero, meaning there is absolutely no flow in that vessel acutely. And what they did was they made a cutoff of global longitudinal strain of greater than minus 14, meaning that the strain is lower than minus 14 and the global myocardial work is less than 1700 millimeter Ag. And they used this from the data that had been 
collected, they created an ROC curve to look at the sensitivity and specificity of these parameters and find these to be significantly sensitive in being able to uh, differentiate acute coronary occlusion. So they use these measures. And now out of their 150 patients, 27 or 21 patients had acute coronary occlusion based on angiographic findings. 26% in the left anterior descending, 41% in the left circumflex, and 33% in the right coronary artery. And so if you look at the data between patients that have acute occlusion versus those that do not have occlusion, there is no change in blood pressure. But what you see is dramatically reduced global longitudinal strain, very reduced global myocardial work. But also, <clears throat> one of the things, if you look at myocardial work by segments. There are at least seven segments involved in patients who have um, acute coronary occlusion. And there are about, on average, seven segments involved in patients who, by strain map if they have acute coronary occlusion versus one or two. So one of the things that he proposed was a, at least having involvement of four segments where the myocardial work appears low is going to be one of the keys in being able to see if this, these patients have uh, acute coronary occlusion. And I would, I would start from with this example of a patient that is in the emergency department with chest pain. Um, the, the way the data is presented is um, uh, there is a strain map of the top half of the bullseye, and there's another strain map, uh, pressure strain map of the bottom half. So it's the same patient, but there are two different bullseye, uh, sorry, uh, pressure strain maps, but they're of the top half and the bottom half. In the top half, what you see is that the myocardial work, which is about 2100 in a normal uh, segment, is about preserved in all the segments, except this apical septal segment, which is 1500. The rest of the segments look okay. But when you look at the bottom half, you see that um, this patient has significantly reduced myocardial work less than 1700 in one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven segments. And this patient had an acute coronary occlusion of the, the right coronary artery as has been seen by this angiogram, um, which, which is the case. And there's a very large area of the myocardium now that is not supplied uh, by, uh, by flow. You can see the whole mid to distal RCA, the, the RV marginals and the PDA, everything is missing, which is why you see that there, there is such reduced myocardial work in almost all the segments of the inferior, posterior, and part of the inferolateral wall because it supplies a very large territory, which is typically what happens when somebody has acute coronary occlusion. They're usually experiencing a, a significant amount of uh, myocardium at risk. So he proposed um, uh, what we could do is look at myocardial work as whether more than four segments are involved at less than 1700 millimeter Hg percentage, and whether more than four segments have uh, a worse uh, global longitudinal strain than greater than minus 14%. And when you use these two parameters, he, uh, he showed with his ROC curves that in fact, the, the myocardial work is still superior with a sensitivity of 81% and a specificity of 82% versus only a sensitivity of 78 and a specificity of 65 with fractional area change. But he also looked at independently, if you just had low myocardial work, low strain and low EF, you can see that uh, global myocardial work still comes out to be superior in being able to um, identify um, acute coronary occlusion. It has high specificity, but still the sensitivity is not as good as if you involved for more than four segments of less than 1700. And then you see that the global longitudinal strain doesn't fare well at all. And the ejection fraction has no significant sensitivity or specificity in being able to predict an acute coronary uh, occlusion, which is extremely interesting because we know that from collateralization, your LVEF can be preserved at the time that somebody is having acute coronary occlusion, which is why it's not a sensitive marker at all to say which patient should go to the cat lab, which is what is uh, what is really um, an important thing from a, from a cost and uh, health perspective and precision and accuracy of which patients should be taken for intervention. 
So here are the ROC curves. And the reason to show this separately apart from the table is I wanted you to see how different these curves look, where the red one, where you've got a fractional area work, functional area uh, myocardial work, which is more than four segments. Once you do that, the ROC curve or receiver operating characteristics of uh, being able to identify acute uh, non-ST elevation are so much better than somebody who's then um, a, uh, someone who's then just ejection fraction, which is in blue or just global strain, which is in light green. Um, again, the fraction functional area restrain, which is more than four segment involvement of greater than minus 14, again, fares better, but not as good as myocardial work. So this, <clears throat> these slides prove the point that strain is sensitive to alteration and loading conditions and systolic blood pressure significantly affected strain measurements in their ability to identify patients with acute coronary occlusion. The dependency of strain on systolic blood pressure was uh, recently confirmed in a clinical study as well. Here's another beautiful example of a patient whose blood pressure is normal and comes in with chest pain, uh, with some troponin leak and, and very minimal EKG changes where you see that the whole um, uh, interoceptal anterior and part of the lateral wall is, is down in terms of the strain. And even when you add um, uh, myocardial work, there is significant drop in myocardial work. This patient acutely uh, did have acute coronary occlusion, whereas this patient who had a very extensive drop in strain, but his blood pressure was 160 at the time. When you actually added myocardial work, you see, you see that some of the strain um, uh, segments that were lower actually normalized. So the, 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 the inferior wall that was low in strain, but when uh, blood pressure was added, the myocardial work is not less than their cutoff of 17, whereas there are only three segments now that have, uh, that have lower myocardial work before, below 1700. And again, there was no significant occlusion in this patient when he was taken to the cat lab. So this becomes a great example of how strain map that looks abnormal can then be adjusted for subsequent myocardial work to improve its accuracy in saying, is this segment, does this patient have acute coronary occlusion in, in, in a defined area? Here's another study by Dr. Kandaharia's group uh, from Wisconsin. Uh, where they evaluated uh, global longitudinal strain, myocardial work, and myocardial efficiency in 115 patients that are referred for coronary and geography with preserved ejection fraction and no wall motion abnormalities for chest pain, shortness of breath, uh, an acute non-ST elevation MI, and a positive stress echocardiogram. And again, this is another data set of, uh, of 100 or so patients that again makes the point that global myocardial work had a much be better uh, ROC curve uh, with area under the curve of 0 0.786 and has, um, uh, and it's better, uh, again, the global myocardial work in this case compared to Dr. Smithsett's group, Dr. Kandaharia did not uh, show a three or four segmentation uh, as being better, but at least this ROC curve is comparable to the ROC curve uh, of the other study where global myocardial work also has uh, good sensitivity and specificity of being able to diagnose uh, ischemia or acute coronary occlusion. Is we're going to be evaluating the utility of work and efficiency in stress echocardiography. Despite excellent specificity of stress echocardiography, what we know from the literature is about 22 to 33% of patients have been reported to have false positive results. One of the most common things that have been alluded to is hypertensive response to exercise, which can induce some uh, subendocardial abnormalities. But despite the fact that the patient does not have any significant epicardial coronary disease, we still end up calling the test positive. Unfortunately, this leads to a cascade of events, which means a second test, which means a coronary intervention. And so what we need to do is we need to ask ourselves, how do we improve the accuracy of this test? Um, myocardial work efficiency 
uh, may further enhance accuracy of the standard 2D uh, stress echocardiography by measuring it at baseline and peak stress during the standard 2D imaging. This is, uh, this is the work that I'm doing for GE, and I have some interesting cases that I can show you. Here's a case of a false positive patient who has hypertensive response at, at peak stress. It's a 41-year-old female with end-stage renal disease and lupus nephritis who undergoes a dubutamine for renal uh, transplant evaluation. Her stress echo is called positive in the basal, mid, and distal infraceptum, and basal and mid inferior, which would be concerning for ischemia in the LAD disease. These are our um, echo uh, strain parameters. You see that the blood pressure shoots up at peak dubutamine at 262 by 111, very typical in renal patients because they have uh, they already, a lot of them have significantly elevated blood pressure at baseline, but um, uh, they tend to have really high uh, uh, blood pressure at peak stress. The global longitudinal strain does not change much. The global myocardial work, if anything, improves, and then the constructive work also improves, and the heart stays at an efficiency of 90% with peak stress. And here is a here is the bullseye myocardial work map and GLS map. And what you see is the baseline GLS is preserved. The baseline myocardial work is 2000. And, I, and more than that, what is more important to me as a clinician is I'm looking at each segment of myocardial work. And what I see is that all the segments have a more than 2100 uh, millimeter AG percentage uh, myocardial work going on. None of the segments are blue. Uh, with the exception of this one little segment. And then what I see is that at peak stress, if you compare this to the bottom, uh, uh, bottom right uh, myocardial work map, because of the severe elevation in blood pressure, you see that the whole map is now significantly red, which means there is significantly increased amount of myocardial work done by this segment. And still there is no particular segment of myocardial work where there is, um, there is a significant drop, whether it's less than 1,700 or less than 1,800 that's quoted by another study. And then we go on to looking at the myocardial efficiency of this myocardium, and it stays just the same. There is not a lot of uh, wasted work that is being done by the myocardium. And this is important because in ischemia, uh, you end up with significant amount of wasted work. So you see clinically that the overall efficiency of the heart is, is fantastic, which argues against any significant ischemic epicardial coronary disease. Now, I'm going to compare that to a patient who is actually a true positive and has a severe hypertensive response at peak stress. It's a 56-year-old with non-obstructive coronary disease, with hypertension, high cholesterolemia, COPD, and active tobacco uh, who undergoes dubutamine for chest pain. The 2D stress echocardiography reported ischemia in the RCA territory, which is basal infraceptum and inferior wall. And the images look like, you know, this, these segments do look hypokinetic. And so what we did was we created a myocardial work map. I'll show it to you in a second. Again, just reiterating that the blood pressure is 262 by 78 at peak stress. The global longitudinal strain is not that different. The overall myocardial work increases, which one would think that if the myocardial work is very high, it would, I argue, against ischemia. The, the myocardial work efficiency is still maintained. Well, it's, it's not completely the same, but it's not dropped a lot. And I will show you the pictures. Here, what you see is that the baseline GLS, the strain is completely normal in the septum and inferior wall. And at peak stress, it drops in fact, if you see this segment, the basal, uh, uh, basal septum, if anything, this segment is lengthening rather than shortening. So you see the blue, in, and it's a positive number, positive six. And you can see also the strain drop in the basal inferior, which would suggest RCA ischemia. Despite the blood pressure being so high, what you see on the myocardial work is a significant drop in myocardial work in these segments as well. And this patient, you know, uh, if we take Dr. Smithhead's data, for example, that talks about having three to four, at least four segments, this patient does not have four segments of the myocardium. Uh, I'm going to tell you why. Um, and this is the myocardial efficiency map. And you can see that there's also a significant drop in efficiency. And it goes to 45% if you look at the basal inferior um, 
uh, that shows that there is significant drop in myocardial work efficiency and a lot of wasted work that is being done in this uh, in this segment. The reason <clears throat> the segments more than three or four segments are not involved is what what we saw on the angiogram is that this patient has complete total occlusion of the mid right coronary artery, but has collaterals to the right uh, to the distal right coronary artery. So a lot of distal right coronary artery segments, which would be the distal, mid to distal inferior and inferior apical segments are actually supplied, being supplied by the LAD, which is why you're not seeing significant ischemia in that segment. But again, this this uh, this is this even I think what I like about this uh, this particular myocardial work map is it may even be in the future be we be, be able to say what where is the where is the uh, 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 occlusion and how much is the occlusion because you can see that it's probably involving more of the mid to distal it's involving prox uh, right coronary artery but it's the, the other segments are probably collateralized which is why the myocardial work map does not show significant ischemia and other uh, segments applied by the right coronary so to end my <clears throat> talk i'm going to go back to the the second slide i want to take you back to the ischemic cascade uh, and and uh, and propose that even before you have significant changes in ejection fraction, which as we know is just a fraction of the amount of volume that is stroke volume that is being ejected by the myocardium, uh, you can actually see significant changes in the true contractility of the myocardium using the, uh, the strain and myocardial work because there have been changes already happening in the myocardial work mechanics. And this is one of the reasons why uh, I think utility of uh, myocardial strain and myocardial work in the emergency department could be extremely useful uh, because we see a substantial number of patients that present with non-ST elevation MI that do not have acute coronary occlusion. They have either hypertensive heart disease, uh, they have microvascular dysfunction uh, in the setting of diabetes, and it's actually not a chest pain that needs to go to the cath lab. I will further add that if you're using this modality to improve your diagnostic accuracy of stress echocardiography, it's going to improve the sensitivity and specificity in the um, false positive patients, but even increase reader confidence in true positive patients. And perhaps you may even be able to localize the area where this problem exists, which is sometimes very useful for the interventionalist before the patient goes to the cat lab. So here are my conclusions. Echocardiography is affordable and portable and already used in the emergency department. Myocardial work and efficiency evaluation can differentiate true coronary occlusion from other causes of chest pain. Um, now, I would, uh, I would argue that we know that on our lab uses primarily uh, GE software, and I know that we can run the myocardial work and efficiency map right on the machine as the patient is, uh, is being, uh, is, is being uh, uh, scanned. And we can quickly give the results to the emergency doctors, which is something that would be of use. Um, and this efficiency, this improved accuracy will really decrease downstream cost and other intermediate tests and will improve patient care, uh, will also improve uh, excellence in patient care, I would say, and would include in, improve cost in a value-based health care model. Thank you for attention. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kamarad, and I thought that was a great overview and some very interesting case examples you showed there. Now, I, th I think that the um, importance of afterload in uh, myocardial work is, is important. And just to make sure I understand this correctly, uh, I think what you're saying is that a hypertensive patient without any damage to the left ventricle, you will typically see a reduction of global longitudinal strain but the work can be preserved or even increased. Is that correct? Yes. So going back to one of the examples that I showed, it's always it's always good to look at examples. Yeah. Um, in this patient, for example, you see when the blood pressure goes up to, to 262, what you see is that the map, the overall myocardial work increases dramatically. Um, but what we see is that the overall efficiency of the heart is still maintained. The heart is not doing a lot of wasted work. The overall stroke work of myocardial work is increased. 
Now, this is useful because if you have segments that are ischemic and are doing a lot of wasted work, which is typical of ischemic segments, you would see that the myocardial work map would, would further uh, show you those segments as increased work. Thank you, Dr. Kumradin. That was great. Thank you so much for sharing your insights. To ensure adequate left ventricular visualization when two or more segments are not well visualized, Optison can help assess wall motion abnormalities by opacifying the left ventricle and delineating endocardial borders. For patients with chest symptoms that are atypical for coronary artery disease, a differential diagnosis using chest X-ray can help establish potentially non-cardiac causes. The AMX240 mobile X-ray system is a truly intelligent system which includes the clinical care suite. Clinical care suite is a set of AI algorithms for automated quality checks, triage, and clinical findings clinical decision support, and automated measurements. Early detection often requires the review of multiple studies, current and historic, to assess for changes. Access to multiple modalities and previous studies is a key component to effective clinical decision making. With Centricity Cardio Enterprise, all information is available in one place. Integration of MUSINX with Centricity Cardio Workflow enables a single cardiology patient jacket with the ability to read all cardiology-related studies, including images from ECHO and ECG, in a single workspace. We know that one of the main reasons for physician burnout is documentation burden. Cardiocentricity Enterprise allows a routine adult ECHO report to be 83% completed before the physician even opens the exam to review. This is possible due to AI-powered automatic measurements and the rules-based engine we call intelligent reporting that automatically generates exam findings and report statements based on measurement values. Now, once pretest probability of coronary artery disease has been established, the further diagnostic strategy can be planned. Should invasive diagnostic catheterization be used? Should non-invasive imaging be used? Anatomical or functional testing? In a value-based environment, selecting the appropriate diagnostic tool based on the patient's pretest probability is key. There are two objectives of diagnosis. Identify the presence of coronary artery disease and detect ischemic coronary artery disease that requires intervention. Anatomical imaging using cardiac CT angiography is a great strategy to diagnose the presence of coronary artery disease. Functional testing can be done with stress echocardiography, stress cardiac MR resonance imaging, nuclear imaging studies, or fractional flow reserve. The Scott Heart trial showed that cardiac CT guided treatment reduced the risk of cardi cardiovascular death and cardio and myocardial infarct in patients with stable chest pain. CT angiography can correctly identify patients with obstructive coronary artery disease. For coronary artery disease detection, CT angiography has 94% sensitivity and it has 99% negative predictive value. Therefore, CT angio can reduce unnecessary invasive diagnostic catheterization. Only G Healthcare has the first ever dedicated cardiac CT scanner with all the required advanced capabilities, and it is accessible for first line coronary artery disease decision making. Cardiograph is two times faster to pay for itself than wide detector general purpose scanners and requires 40% smaller room size. Visipake is the only contrast media for intravascular use that is isomolar to blood at all concentrations. It is also the only FDA-approved contrast media for coronary CT angio. CT angiography is a great modality for anatomical testing, but to assess the functional impact on the left ventricle, there are other modalities better suited for this. The choice of functional testing typically depends on accessibility, preference, and experience. 
For the intermediate risk patient population, a negative stress echo may be able to reduce the need for additional testing and decrease cost of care. Our David series include AFI stress protocols to quantify global and segmental strain for wall motion assessment at each stress level. Stress Cardiac MR provides functional imaging that can be used to rule out or rule in ischemic coronary artery disease. CMR stress testing provides important incremental information about clinical risk factors and resting wall motion abnormalities for clinical decision making, especially in patients at intermediate risk. Cigna Architect Air enables patient-friendly exams with a large 70 bore providing clinical versatility and comfort. Consistently better image quality with Air Recon DL that helps improve signal to noise ratio and image sharpness, assess reduced perfusion, viability, scar transmurality, and fibrosis. Myocardial perfusion imaging modalities such as single photon emission computerized tomography offers a great option to evaluate patients for presence of coronary artery disease that is flow limiting and causing ischemia. SPECT imaging is indicated for patients with high probability of coronary artery disease. Discovery NM is solely dedicated to cardiac imaging. It provides improved patient experience with up to four times lower injection dose. Recent advancements in SPECT technology have made it possible to enhance the clinical value of nuclear cardiology. Acceleris can confirm suspected triple vessel and microvascular disease. For patients with the highest likelihood of coronary artery disease, invasive coronary angiography detects and quantifies the presence and extent of coronary artery disease. Innova IGS and Alia IGS both have Autorite, our AI-based imaging chain. Autorite dynamically optimizes the image quality and dose parameters in real time. By fully automating image optimization throughout the entire procedure, clinicians and technologists are relieved of tedious and complex tasks so that they can focus on the patient. Again, being able to document procedures with minimum effort is key. Centricity Cardio Enterprise can create normal left heart cath reports in just five clicks. Revascularization may be required for patients who present with chest pain. High quality coronary angiography is key for maximizing percutaneous coronary intervention outcomes. PCI outcomes rely on successful balloon and stent deployment. Assuring appropriate stent placement and full deployment requires high quality imaging. By combining Innova IGS with PCI Assist, complex coronary interventions can be made simple. PCI Assist can help improve visualization of stent deployment as well as anatomical visibility by up to 85% in moving arteries at the same dose and up to 75% in larger patients. For complex PCI procedures, such as bifurcations, PCI assist helps to increase accuracy of stent placement. In the cath lab, the MACLAB hemodynamic recording system provides seamless interoperability. MACLAB Altex provides a place for recording patient vitals and documentation at the point of care reducing potential errors and saving time. Once documented, everything is exported to the EMR so that all data can be stored in the same location. Cardiac monitoring during interventions is important to quickly manage any arrhythmias and ongoing ischemia. Early identification of rhythm changes, SD changes, and Q wave changes is important to provide a proper treatment and assure positive outcomes. GE's Carescape monitoring portfolio analyzes four independent simultaneous ECG leads that help earlier and more accurately identify arrhythmias. Furthermore, interventional cardiology insights give better day-to-day -day inventory management and overview, including expiring inventory, physician cost per case, and inventory on hand. It helps optimize invasive cardiology operations 
by monitoring case volumes and case workflow times. Follow-up for patients who have had a myocardial infarction is important to minimize long-term mortality and morbidity, including risk of sudden cardiac death. Follow-up assessment depends on clinical status and may, for symptomatic cases, bring the clinical pathway back to detection, diagnosis, or treatment. Annual ECG and possibly less frequent echocardiography for assessment of LV function and valvular status can be beneficial. For patients who have experienced myocardial infarction, assessment of left ventricular function is recommended because depressed LV function would influence pharmacological therapies and may increase risk of sudden cardiac death requiring additional intervention. Our Vivid scanners offers AFI with full automatic recognition of apical imaging views and measurements of GLS and peak strain dispersion, also known as mechanical dispersion. Mechanical dispersion has shown to have value to predict risk of arrhythmias in post-MI patients. A full set of reproducible measurements for assessment of LV enlargement can be performed automatically with new AI algorithms developed using deep learning. LV size measurements can be completed with three clicks, freeze, measure, auto. A resting 12-lead ECG at one year or longer intervals between studies in patients with stable symptoms might be reasonable. ECG can identify LV hypertrophy and ECG repolarization abnormalities, which can indicate increased risk of mortality and morbidity. The Muse NX offers the ability to easily compare ECGs to quickly identify if any ECG changes are new or consistent with previous abnormalities. Smart Lead ECG helps minimize patient data mix-ups by automatically detecting when a new patient is connected. Smart Auto ECG reduces repeats by immediately capturing and displaying the first clean, high-quality waveform. Patients suffering from coronary artery disease require strong care coordination to assure effective secondary prevention and management, also post-treatment. Most patients with coronary artery disease are managed by multiple providers across the care continuum, including both hospital and ambulatory settings. To assure effective care coordination, all team members managing these patients require access to the patient's history, previous ECGs, imaging studies, and treatment plan. Centristi Cardiology Enterprise has been named best in class for cardiology IT by CLASS, an industry-trusted research and insights firm. That completes the chronic coronary syndrome pathway and how GE Healthcare provides solutions for heart care teams to develop a systematic approach to disease detection and management across the continuum of care. We will continue to be your heart care partner as we develop new and innovative solutions to exceed your expectations. We believe artificial intelligence will disrupt current clinical workflows by predicting the individual patient's disease progression and empower care teams to make decisions with the best possible tool. Thank you so much for your attention.